going to do, I don't think, I know, but I'm going to uh, present it to you guys, and uh, it's truly a man of God, man. Amen. In the good and the bad, <laughs> in the good times and the bad times. That's what we all have to learn, amen? Amen. Praise Him all the time. Amen. TJ. Amen.
growing up as a really uh, young guy by myself, uh, some of you know my story, but uh, my dad died when I was 14, and, it, and that same week my mom uh, uh, took off, and she abandoned us. So after a while of being alone, every time that I would struggle with pornography or, 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 or masturbation or, or sexual brokenness, I would always run back to that place where I felt more loved, where I felt more worth coming into my life. And in that time of, of, of period, for me, when a young boy is still getting these urges, is still growing as a man, I was by myself. So this, this was something that was so ingrained in me from childhood. I didn't know how to fight it. I didn't know how to break free from it. But little by little, God started showing me how this issue that is going on today, it's had a beginning somehow. And he was touching on this beginning by connecting uh, the story of David. And how David, God sees him as a man after his own heart. Because that's what he was about. But at the same time, there was something in it, inside of him, that was always battling with one another. So in Acts uh, 13.22, it says that David is a man after God's own heart. But yet he fell into temptation. I believe that it, it, it came from him entertaining that thought of when he saw Bathsheba bathing in the in the, in the, in the ceiling of, 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 of a building. And he started entertaining that thought, which led in time to actually committing the adultery. So you see, there's always something that leads us slowly through falling. But it started with a seed. So I always got the analogy. I work in construction, and I always go underneath houses, and, and I would see uh, uh, plumbing and a whole bunch of different things. But one of the things that always captured me is when I saw... Um, a beam, which is almost half of the size of this, just collapsed. And I was there to fix that problem, that foundation problem. And when I, when I asked the guy, when I went and see it, you know what it was? It was termites. Termites ate up through the whole beam. And I realized that this is, that's how sin is. Sin is just like a termite. It's a really small little thing. But it doesn't have to be strong and muscular to devour something that strong. It just has to be constant. Constant. Non-stop. Non-stop. And the more that they devour and devour and devour, the more that it grows into something that can be shattered. Even though to humanity sees that, man, that's, no one can break that. Especially a little, small, tiny termite. However, in real life, that's what happens to us. We are always so... Um, Tempted to hide. I was doing a, a research on how many pastors um, struggle with this, and Barna did a study on it. And out of 30, uh, out of out of three hundred pastors, twenty five percent of senior pastors struggle with sexual brokenness. Fifty three percent of youth pastors struggle with pornography. Currently. So I always think about every time that we go through some sort of sexual brokenness, something led to that. However, as married men, as, 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 as godly people, sometimes God allows us to go through some struggles. Sometimes God allows us to go through something for His greater glory. But just as David, um, he always wanted to uh, fix everything. Because that's another thing that's ingrained in us. Once we get caught, or once we uh, try to hide stuff, we always try to fix stuff on our own. So uh, I was thinking about that, and I remember my dad telling me uh, a joke. And, and to him, all the jokes had a, a bigger meaning, right? And he tells me about, I was actually sharing with that, <laughs> with Jeremy the other day. And uh, this is a, so a guy goes to a, a, a hotel, and he gets his, his room, and they give him a card. And he says, with this card... This is the only room that we have, and it's a share. You're gonna share the room, and there's, you're gonna share the bathroom. There's a room here and a room here, and the bathroom's in the middle. You use this card. You open the card. You, put, you set the card. It's gonna open the door, but it's not gonna open the door if the other person from the other side is using the bathroom. Until he exits the bathroom, you, when you swipe it, you're gonna be able to go in the bathroom. So it's okay, cool, that's fine. I mean, I need the room, so I'll, let's get the room. So he he gets the room, and then he needs to go to the bathroom really bad. Um, and he tries to swipe it and swipe it and swipe it and the door won't open. 
So he says, you know what, forget it, like, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to do it. So he grabs a, 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 a sock, and he poops on the sock. <laughs> and he says, man, i, I got to get rid of this. So he goes and opens the window and starts going like this, you throw it out, and he throws it, and when he turns around, he didn't realize that the sock had a hole in it. So the hole is all around this room, and at that moment, like, the waiter comes and says, I'm here with your food, and he starts looking at everything that's there, and he says, the guy says, hey dude, I'll give you $100 if you don't say anything. Just don't say anything. And the dude here is like, I'll give you $200 if you teach me how to shit up like <laughs> aware of what he was happy about, but it goes back to this, it goes back to every time this happens to us though, right? We create a mess, and then we try to fix things, either by hiding them, or by telling God, if you do this for me, God, then I'll make it all right, right? We, we try to gamble with God, and tell him like, no, no, just, just, just don't, pretend you didn't see that, Lord, pretend you didn't see that, pretend that never happened, Lord. Because I'm going to do this and it's going to be great. There's always that in our hearts, trying to fix stuff. So for me, um, we always are fixing things for ourselves. And Paul says that he himself struggles with this as well, in Romans 8. And to me, it gives me a lot of hope in what he actually says that I struggle with this. I haven't obtained this already. However, I put my, my eyes on the goal. I put my, uh, my eyes on the prize. But he, t he tells you that I, I haven't arrived there yet. Right. He's keeping it real. He's telling everybody, like, I don't know how you see, how you see me, but I'm, I'm not there yet. Right. Whatever you see in me is encouragement because I'm focusing on the goal. That's my goal. Right. That's where I want to go. So today, uh, it's funny that, that he was talking about um, Luke 15, because that's where we're going. Um, so in Luke 15, it talks about the different parables, right? It's got the parable of the sheep, the uh, parable of the lost coin, the parable of the lost son. Um, so God, God put me put in my heart to share about this um, because there's a lot of things that we go through uh, in our daily lives man, where we allow the enemy to attack us, attack us so strong that we feel that we're not worth it. We feel that, that, that man, like, I'm just a, a, another guy. So one of the things that I told the closest guys to me, as I told, I asked them this question. I said, what do you see in me? What do you really see in me? Because there's a lot of guys that, that I, I'm connected with, but I have a core uh, group of people that really know me, that has lived life with me for four years now, and they really know the good and the bad. And not that I have told them, they have seen it in me. And I asked them, what do you see in me? And of course, because they love me, they're my friends, they told me, like, well, see, you're a man that loves God. You see, I, I see a servant. I see uh, an encourager. And I told them, you know what you don't see? You don't see me broken. Amen. I'm man. broken, guys. Amen. Man. And they were like, I, I think we don't try to focus on that. And I said, I agree. Me neither. But doesn't change that that is a reality. Yeah. And in here, in the, in the parable of the lost sheep, it kind of brings two different um, scenarios, right? <clears throat> but but in, this, in, this, in these stories, Jesus is trying to get a point across. And the point across that he's trying to get in all these parables is that your thinking and my thinking are not the same. Uh, They're just not the same. And I'm going to show you here how it's not the same. However, in a logical world, I will start, I, I, when I read that book, I started to get upset because of what the text is actually showing. So in the text it says on, on, on 15.1, it says, Now the tax collector and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, The man welcomes sinners and eats with them? Then Jesus told them this parable. So that's his crowd. That's where he's talking, about. that's where he's engaging them to hear this. That was his main uh, object, uh, um, the goal, uh, target. And he says, and Jesus told him this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he have the ninety-nine? Doesn't doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he 
joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be no more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. <coughs> so in here when I read just that first one story, when I read it carefully, I was like, I'm not there yet. Because when I read that story, it says, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 to the open country and go after the last one sheep? That makes no sense to me. You already have 99. Why would you go for that one? Maybe going by that one, you're going to lose more of the 99 than the one that you just went to get. Again, me as a questioning guy, I'm always concerned and thinking about how I think and trying to impose how I think into the scriptures. When the scriptures are telling me how the text is being written, because it's a pur it has a purpose. So when I read this one, it tells me I'm not there yet. I don't have the mind of God yet in my heart. I'm working in that area. God is taking me in this journey with Him. But it allows me to see and encourages me to be there, to go there. So it tells me, so to me, it's not logical that you leave the 99. To me, it's logical you actually leave, it, leave the other one because you already have 99. To Jesus, what is logical to me is not logical to Jesus. So Jesus says, no, I don't think that. I would definitely go for the one. Amen. Keep thinking about this recurring theme. Then it says, the parable of the lost coin. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins. Oh, by the way, it says that when it finds it, it says that uh, he lets people know that he found the sheep. And it says that he rejoices. He says there's a party. He says that he... he uh, he uh, um, um, rejoices. I mean, he's, he's having a great time because he found the lost sheep. And here it says, and the second one it says, or, or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the whole the, the house, and searches carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors, and together. And says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Amen. Amen. The first story says, 99 persons who do not need to repent. The second story says, there is rejoicing in the presence of angels of God over one sinner to repent. There's an invitation there in the second story. Right? Yeah. In the first one it says that it's better if there's no one to repent. And the second one is great if there's one to repent. He's, he's, he's slowing them talking to that crowd. Remember it's target. So in the second part, it's talking about the exact same thing. If you ca if caught it. It's talking about a person who's lost a coin. Right? And he searches everywhere for this coin. Right? And then he invites people to come over to celebrate her finding that coin makes no sense to me. I'm going to tell you why. It makes no sense because you just found one, you just turned this house apart to find one coin, and now you're going to spend more coins to entertain the person you just invited. Oh, man. In my logical mindset, it makes no sense. But Jesus says, it makes sense to me. He has a point to go across. He moves to the parable of the lost son. The lost son. Jesus continues. He says, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the state. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off at a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. First of all, he asked the father, Father, give me my, my share. Give me my money. Right? Yeah. Which usually in this culture, it was, it's given when the father is passed on all his inheritance and splits it and gives it to the firstborn. He's saying, no, you know what? I, I, don't, I don't need to wait that long. I already have the fulfillment up here to know what to do with this money. Give me my money. I think about this story and how, much, how many times I have told God the same thing. 
And in the story, it says that he respects his decision. Man, it says that he does that, give him his share. Think about that. It says, not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off to a distant country. And there he squandered his wealth and in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the, with the pots that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare. In this moment of the story, he's being reminded. Reminded of what he had at home. And in this moment, he's also reminded how much the father lavished love on him. And think about this story. Think about what, you, what he just said right there. He doesn't say, which again, he doesn't say, I long for my father's food. He says, I long for my father's servant leftover food. See how far he went from this place saying, give me my inheritance. I deserve this. To how, because of what happened in the circumstances, he went from the father, being with the father, to being away from the father, to being a servant, <clears throat> to not being a servant, to having the leftover food of the servant. See how far he came from one side to the other? Yeah. Circumstances yeah. happen in his life to where this visual that God has given us here is humbling a person. Wow. And it's encouraging to exalt this humbleness as you go back to the Father. Amen. And in here it says that when he came to his senses, meaning before he didn't, he said, how many of my father's higher servant have food to spare? And there, and here I'm starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. Do you ever do that? When you're going to go to talk to Jesus, do you prepare a story for yourself of how you're going to talk to Jesus? <laughs> I've always believed that when you talk to the Father, the Father is holy. The Father is perfect. The Father is, is beautiful. So in my brokenness, in my sin, in order for me to get to that point, I got to fix myself a little bit. I got to serve a little bit. I got to read a little bit. I got to pray a little bit. And then when I'm in the sense of just connecting with the Father again, then I can invite Him in. Because if I'm in the state, then um, I can talk to Him now. Because I'm a little better now. But He will never meet me over here. Man. Praise He's not going to meet me over here. However, however, in the state where I'm at right now, In, in the state where I'm at right now, I don't think that God would talk to me. Uh, no I have to fix a little bit more in order for Him to come to me. <coughs> and this is a mentality that we have from growing up. <coughs> that in order for my parents to love me a little bit more, I have to get better grades. I have to uh, take the trash out. I to, and then when I see in their faces, okay, He's mighty, okay? He's coming to give me a hug, okay? Now I'm loved. Oh, amen. And we carry this out. <clears throat> Again, in the same visual that we have, we were, we were ingrained with this from the beginning. So now that we know that Jesus has a different mindset than ours, He actually does not want to have that upon ourselves. So He says, when he came to the senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving today. 
I will set out to go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and I have sinned against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Man. How do you get to that place? From son to servant. Man. To be with the pigs. It's by losing his identity of sonship. Amen. Of who you are in me. Amen. Not because of what you do, but because of who you are. Amen. Come on. Who you belong to. Amen. Thank you. And it says, But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to the son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. He's repeating the story that he prepared for the father. Man, you know what the father does? He dismisses that story. He doesn't even acknowledge that story. If you see right here, the father doesn't go, uh, yeah, you are. No. The father knows who the son is. Yeah. He doesn't need to explain to the son who he is. He's going to show the son who he is. And in this, remember what he just did. He told the father, Father, I don't need you. I, I can take care of my life. Yeah. And then he's coming back saying, Father, I need you. I need your help. But I'm not worthy of being your son. You can just give me whatever left over, whatever you have. And the father's like, no, you're my son. You are my son. You are very valuable to me. And he says... He doesn't just say something. He allows everybody to know. Remember still who he's talking to. He's talking to Pharisees. He's talking to, he, has a, he has a target while he's talking to this. He knows, he's not talking to just unbelievers all around. He's encouraging unbelievers of his goodness and his love while he's sharing the story. But he, his love is for those who are rejecting him. That's who right. are there to test him. Who are there to get him in the wrong thing. Right. His love goes beyond just what's in front of him. This is not just... For them, he's actually screaming for love for those who are rejecting him. Yeah. I can wow. so connect with, with this as an ex-atheist. This story was screaming for me. God was screaming for me as an atheist. I'm talking to you. Amen. Good. Amen. 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 And he has brought me this far. And he says there, The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and I have sinned against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, not to the son, to the servant, quick, bring the best robe and put him on him. Amen. Think about that. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened cow and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. In other words, what do you see that is? It's a pachanga. We're going to have a party right now. Right? He's saying, get sandals because he's about to be dancing right now. That's what he's going to be. He's going to need, he's going to need sandals because we're going to dance right now. He doesn't address the fact of where he's been. He doesn't. Again, to me, it makes no sense to me. That story makes no sense to me. As a father, as my father taught me, if you couldn't mess up, oh, you're going to get it. I'm going to put you in this room and I'm going to make you learn and know what you just did. But in here, Jesus continues to tell everybody there, including me. It makes sense to me. It might make sense to you that I don't go and beat him up. <clears throat> that I don't show him how far he's gone. Wow. And how it's your fault, how you're... To the father, like, come celebrate. Wow. Amen. Because my wow. last son has come back. And it says right here, let's feast and celebrate. For his son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. 
Right there and then. He revealed to them, you are my son. Clothing, when he puts clothes on them, is the cloth of righteousness of God. Right. It's saying, you belong to me. And because you belong to me, it's not about what you do. It's about who you belong to. You belong to someone with righteousness. That's me. Amen. When he puts the ring, that represents royalty. You're not just any kid. You're the king of, you're the, the son of a king. <laughs> That's how I see you. I don't see you as, as one of those. You're the son of a king. Man. This represents you are my son. And he says, kill the fattest cow. We're gonna have a feast. We're gonna have community. We're not just celebrating on our own. People are going to be joyful and we're gonna party together. But there was also another son. Uh, <clears throat> again, God's calling for those who are listening. It's his heart for them. For this son of mine was dead as alive again. He was lost and is found. So they begin to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, what was going on? And somebody says, your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened cow. Stop there. How does he know? How does the person who went to the lost, the sun is outside, there's hearing music. He's not even inside yet. He just heard the party. Somebody came out from the party and tell him what's going on in the party. How does he know that your son has come back and the cow is, because he just came from there. So think about this servant that's coming to tell the other son, you want to know what's happening? Your brother came back, man. This guy didn't just come out the way that I see it. It just came out and say, hey, dude, well, your brother came back. And... No, this guy, remember where, Remember the context. This guy just came from a party. This guy is like, have a chuleta or some, some sort of ribeye. <laughs> <here." laughs> so like, dude, you're never going to believe this, man. Like, juices are coming down his hand and he's like eating. And like, man, your brother came back, man. Like, this, this is his state. He's coming and expressing to this brother, we're celebrating for the return of your brother. And this brother's like, what? This makes sense to me. I've been slaving myself for my father. What are you talking about? He should be in that freaking corner over here getting spanked and getting yelled at. Because I've been here just working like a... This makes sense to me. To the father says. To me, it goes back to who is he trying to reach? And here it says, Your brother has come, and he, and he replied, And your father has killed the fat man because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. Things slipped from the son that stayed with him from the beginning. The son that says, give me my inheritance somehow. Something happened along this journey to bring this person back. And by bringing this person back, it revealed something else on the other side. It got swapped. Now the second son becomes the first son. And as he's sharing the story, he tells him, he went, the father went out to plead with him. Because the father doesn't see no difference between your sons. Just like he pleaded with the first one, he's pleading with the second one. And it says, The older brother became angry and refused to go in, so his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet, you never gave me even a younger girl so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son... When this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fan count for him? And the father says, My son, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. 
But we had to celebrate Amen. and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. Amen. He was lost and is found. Amen. In this story, man speaks volumes to me. He says, this is my thinking. You need to run from there to here. Stop eating with the pigs, son. Stop craving for the food of my servant's leftover food. You're my son. You're the son of a king. Perhaps right now you don't feel like the son of a king. But in this story, I remember who he's trying to reach. Not just the crowd he's right in front of him. He's trying to reach those who are all the way back there. And letting them know there's room for you. There's room for you here. Um, and again, as we are here right now today, God has revealed some stuff to you. And I believe that when we come together in a gathering like this, God uses this to bring out things of the core of the human body. And you're only going to uh, move forward with it with transparency. Some of you uh, struggle with sexual uh, brokenness. And it's something that's so ingrained in us from when we were young. Things that we engage in. And to me, when I read the story, when he says that you squander your money in wild living, it tells me the question, what kind of wild living have I been living? And we often go, as a believer, I can't share what I've been squandering. As a believer, it's shameful because you're not supposed to do these things. Because you're not supposed to be. Remember, this story is Jesus talking about two sons. He understands that these are sons. He understands that you are his child. What we go through in this broken world is so tempting to just give in. Everything in culture right now, everything in society is just pushing you to give in. It's cool to do it right now. But God's a different. God says that he's better. And right now, through these parables, he's trying to reach those who are not just already believers, but he's letting them know that even as you are now a believer, and you still struggle with this, just like the toll says that 53% of youth pastors struggle with this, that's no coincidence. These are people who pour into another person. Remember, these are people who are being followed. Why is there such a struggle with this? It's because this is at the core of every man. Amen. Not just sexual brokenness, but just brokenness in general. Because God put us in this earth to lead other people. Wives, children, other people. That's the main target of the enemy. That's why this is so powerful. Men, Men. coming here to be uplifted and encouraged to become the child and walk out living in truth. Amen. Yeah. That is what changes us. But at the same time, it also allows us to understand that if you do fall, that's to change the face of the father. He doesn't, you, need, you don't need to clean yourself a little bit better so that I can come to where you're at. <clears throat> One of my biggest things for me is understanding the fact that when I fall, when I give in, God tells me, I have a purpose for that. So, man. To me, it used to mean, stopping equals healing. If I'm not doing this anymore, I'm healed from it. And I believed this lie for so many years. Healing doesn't equal to stopping. Healing equals invite me in. To you, 
might be to, right now, it might be, my grace is sufficient for you. I need you to walk with this, because I, I have a purpose for this. I'm not saying that this should be used as an excuse. This is just an encouragement. You invite him in and let him be your everything. As you're walking with him, naturally things start going away. One of the things that I always encourage every time I teach anything is don't stop singing. Some of you look at the Bible and say, well, Jesus said a lot of times to stop singing. But there's more to that. Stop singing. What I do encourage you is follow Jesus with all your heart. Amen. Because when you concentrate on and stop singing, your focus is sin. Wow. Your focus is yourself stopping, avoiding, looking away. But when your focus is Jesus, yes. sin naturally goes away from you. Yeah. Amen. Because your focus is Him. Your focus is not stopping. Right. Instead of not going, you're walking together. And He's doing the work for you. <coughs> Eventually you'll realize that you don't need to do anything trying to not to stop. Yeah. Naturally you stop. And that naturally means <coughs> it's Jesus. Jesus is the one that just by walking with Him, you start becoming more. <coughs> you start praising Him more. When we go through hardships, again, we are very um, big on beating each other up. I just want you to know that you're repeating somebody else's words. <coughs> you're repeating your father's, maybe? Some male figure that you had in your life? Someone you saw administrating uh, some sort of uh, tough love to somebody and you immediately grab that and you put it on that and says you're like that guy and in here God shows you that I'm not like that he constantly reveals to us that my love for you my grace for you you couldn't even be that how much I love So now as we go back, now that we know this truth, which I believe, honesty, transparency brings truth, which in time brings healing. Right, right. Look at all the stories in the Bible where people say, you are that man, and then he says, yes, I am. I have sinned against you, and I have, I have sinned against God, and I have sinned against you. Transparency. The more transparency you see in the Bible, when, when, when talking to Peter, he says, Lord, forgive me, I'm a sinner. And he says, I, I grant him, but not the other. Transparency. The more transparency you see recurring theme in the Bible, you can see that God honors transparency. Because transparency re, uh, brings you the truth, and in time, it brings you healing. So again, healing doesn't mean stopping. Healing means inviting him in, and in time, you will get healing. Yeah. Healing means you invite him in. And in this journey, some of you are already in this journey. Some of you brought, God brought you here to, today to start that journey. And it starts with transparency. So what I want to do next is an exercise. In this exercise, I want you to close your eyes and start thinking about the areas of your life right now that you are truly struggling with. Any area of your life. Not to focus on your sin, but to tell God, God, you're bringing it up to light. Here it is. This is what I'm struggling with right now, Lord. Whatever the, whatever the case may be, anger, pornography, masturbation, whatever the case may be, pride, <coughs> and bring it up to the Lord. Say, Lord, here it is. I'm bringing it up to the light. With your eyes closed, ask Jesus, Jesus, do you see it?
as you plead with him, asking him, to help you, to take it from you, to surrender it to Him. Now what I want you to think about is a person that you trust, a person that's your friend, a person that you can confide in. Start repeating that name in your mind. <clears throat> Open your eyes. encouragement is this. Whatever you thought, whatever your struggle is right now, current struggle, there's more debt to your current struggle. What you do is a superficial outcome of something that happened to you that's deeper. This journey of that person you thought about is someone that you can talk to. When you started thinking about that person, I was praying to God to reveal to you the person that he wants you to talk to. Not just because it's your friend, not just because he's going to agree with you, but because the Lord is going to use that we're two or more gathered there in the midst. Because we're confess your sins to one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Because yes. you're inviting him in and telling God, take this from me. Again, healing is not a snap. Healing is a journey. The encouragement is to start that journey. <clears throat> remember this, this story. Remember the story of how he thinks and how we think. When you start thinking about this side of the story, always go back to his side of the story. And this is where you stand. Amen. This is truth. Amen. This is who your father is. Not anything else. This is the mindset of the father. This is what the father thinks of you. You are my child. You're never too dirty for me to go after you. Amen. You're never too broken for me not to pursue you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your patience. We are here, Father God, pursuing you and seeking after you. And we know that in this broken world, we still go through trials and tribulation. But you tell us to take heart, for you have overcome the world. I pray right now, Father God, that you will overflow, that you will um, overpower our emotions, our thoughts, our decisions, Father, with your love, your grace, your pursuit of us, Father, as we engage in who you are and who we are, who we belong to, <clears throat> everything that you have in store for us, Father God. I pray for all the families that are here, Lord, for, for all the, 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 the men that have families, for all those uh, broken marriages, for all those broken father and child relationships, Father God. I pray that through this story, we are able to relate more with your spirit and follow through to have a stronger relationship with our family members. To move forward in your truth, with your love, with your compassion, with your self-control, with your patience. That you would transform areas of our hearts, Father God, that today we surrender to you. I pray for every individual here, Father God, that this is not just another sharing. That they truly keep their commitment to meeting with that person and revealing to you, Father God, audibly how the devil has no more grip on us. Shame has shattered today because we believe that your healing is so much better. Amen. Amen. We believe that walking with you, Father God, our worth in you is far more greater than anything that we can ever imagine. 
Open our hearts, Father God, to be in light to more of your love, Lord. We are here as your children, Father God. Yes. Crying out to you, Father God. And saying, Lord, yes, Lord. you are the Lord of my life. Lord. Yes. Teach me your ways, Father. Yes. Teach me how to be a better child. Yes. By simply receiving who I am in you. Yes. You are enough for me, Lord. And we thank you for this amazing morning, Lord. You are a holy, beautiful, and amazing God, Jesus. Holy Spirit, I just pray, Father, that you would continue to pursue us and make us aware of the things that we take for granted of how much you are involved in our lives, Lord. To be encouraged by the things that you have done for us, Father. By who you are, Lord. Some of these decisions are not easy. Some of these topics are not easy. But you call us to become more like you. You encourage us, Father God, to live in the spirit and not in the flesh. So as we continue with this journey with you, Father God, we pray that you transform us more into the beautiful image and likeness of your son, Jesus Christ. See the beautiful name that we pray. Oh, 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 oh,